welcome everyone to this uh, water talk. My name is Roy Brouwer, um, and I'm very happy to um, introduce the speaker of today. But before I do that, I'm just going to do a land acknowledgement. I want to start by acknowledging that we're participating today from traditional territories of the first people. We participate today from land that is part of the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee people. And here you see a map with the um, 1784 Haldeman Treaty, the land that was granted to the Six Nations, and that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. The University of Waterloo and its centers and institutes, like the Water Institute, are committed to raise awareness and contribute to Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls for action. So then, the introduction to the speaker of today. We're very honored to have Professor Gunilla Oeberg with us today. Dr. Oeberg is professor at the Institute for Resources, Environment and Sustainability at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, and is also professor at the Center for the Study of Sciences and Humanities at the University of Bergen in Norway. Dr. Oeberg is recognized for her groundbreaking research on chlorine biogeochemistry, her work on interdisciplinary research and higher education, as well as for her leadership of interdisciplinary environmental programs. Recently, Dr. Oeberg's research has explored the role of expertise and expert knowledge in complex areas where science is uncertain and disputed, and the silent exclusion of knowledge that clashes with dominant sciences, uh, such as indigenous knowledge. Dr. Oeberg's current projects focus on chemicals of concern and microplastics and ask important questions such as what kind of knowledge is needed, used, and trusted to come up with effective solutions. The title of her talk, you can see it here. Um, and please join me in welcoming Professor Oeberg to the floor. Thank you very much for that introduction. And, um, and thank you to the, to the landowners, the the Anishinaabek, and the neutral people for allowing us to be here. I guess that University of Waterloo is just like University of British Columbia, still not paying rent. But so we're happy that we are allowed to be here in spite of that. Um, oh, where do I have this? So water, what a wonderful topic for a research institute. According to the uh, New Oxford American Dictionary, which is the dictionary you get if you push you know, the buttons on the, on the Mac, um, water is a compound of oxygen and hydrogen, the chemical formula is H2O, with highly distinctive physical and chemical properties. It's able to dissolve many other substances. It's solid form ice, it's less dense than its liquid form. Its boiling point, viscosity, and surface tension are usually high for are unusually high for its molecular weight, and it's partially disassociated into hydrogen uh, hydroxyl ions. And at the Wikipedia, I find a similar definition. Um, these are not very good descriptions of water, are there? Um, we all know that water is so much more, uh, even from a strictly chemical point of view. In the lab. Uh, when we've done our best to purify it, there's still impurities. Um, real water is very, very far from pure H2O. Um, it's pretty messy. Um, impurities, they're not the exception, they're the rule, which the word suggests that they aren't. Um, and alongside those impurities, we have bacteria, algae, beavers, and whatnot. Even though we know that water and issues related to water are uh, extremely complex, at times we talk about it as if it were pure H2O. Uh, and um, is that a problem? I think it is. Um, and I will try to explain why. Questions related to water are both complex and complicated. And they fit well in what Rittle and Weber describe as uh, uh, wicked problems. And in their paper, uh, which is from 1973, they identify a series of characteristics that are typical for wicked problems. Most importantly, I guess you can find uh, things that fit there for, for water, but most importantly is that all solutions for wicked problems uh, have unintended consequences. So there aren't any 
pure solutions are more re-solutions. We always have to rethink uh, the solutions. <coughs> and uh, one of the key take-homes from the paper is that dealing with wicked problems requires a multitude of competencies. Interdisciplinary research is often, uh, has often proved to be more challenging than anticipated. I don't know what your experience is uh, here at the Institute, but if you find that it's super simple to work with people with completely different backgrounds, or if it's more aligned with my own experience, that it often takes time, it's often quite challenging, and after you work with someone, you think you're on totally the same page, and then suddenly you realize that you're not understanding each other at all. Um, a core reason is that people speak past each other. And another reason is that we, as academics, we have a tendency of using shorthand, like H2O, to talk about complex matters, which unconsciously leads to narrowing framing uh, that excludes other facets of the issue. Scientists are trained to be curious, to ask questions, to probe, to debate, uh, to be open-minded, to question, to go back to the drawing board, and to rethink. Uh, the core of science is to be non-dogmatic. That's what most clearly distinguishes science from religion. There is no right answer. Uh, we know that any method, any evidence, any theory can be challenged uh, by a new method, by new evidence, uh, by a new theory. But we're human. And most of us, we love our work, uh, and we use shorthand for a lot of things. These things together have a tendency to make it, make it ourselves blind to our own way of seeing. And at times, we might even become dogmatic. My talk today is about the challenges of interdisciplinary work, the barriers uh, that come from the inside of our own practices, and what we as scientists might be able to do about it. And I would like to start by asking you to help me. Uh, what is this image showing? What is this image about? Someone. Yeah? A Lego mill, like the fan thing that they have in the desert in America. It's a fan thing that they have in the desert, yeah. <laughs> it's drawing water. It's drawing water. It's a fan thing, a Lego fan thing drawing water. What else is this image about? Desert. Desert. What else do you see? Tools. Tools. Repair. Again? Repair. 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 Civilization coming to Anathasia. Civilization coming to Anathasia. Great. Thank you. Yeah? It is an advert toy. <laughs> I didn't think you would get that, but it is. <laughs> I would go, and this is an advert toy. So, <laughs> so this could be, this could actually be about, it could be air pollution, because you see this sort of uh, layer here that sort of keeps a lid on things. It could be about desertification. It could be about water. It could be about pumping oil. It could be about the energy crisis. And it could be an ad for a toy. <laughs> Depending on what we see here, and I was kind of expecting you to go more towards water things, <laughs> because this is a water institute and we're academics, and I'm from the Institute of Resource and Environment Sustainability. Um, and if we frame it as something to talk with kids about air pollution, we're framing this as something completely different, the things we will be talking about, thinking about, the things that I will get you to think about if I point out that you have this layer here of, of if it's dust or if it is, is ozone or little, you know, whatever it is that gives that kind of lid. Or if we start talking about, okay, this is a pump, the kind of thing they have to paint, pump up water or oil. Um, what would that lead to? If it's water, what kind of questions do we have? Is this is tied to fracking? What you start thinking about them. So how we frame this impacts very much how we think about this image. If it is an ad for a, a, a Lego toy, which it is, um, then, and this was an audience uh, of people selling toys, you would start thinking completely different things. How would you sell it? Is this a good image to sell the toy? Uh, would we market it in a different way? Uh, how can we get in other toys to show this way, etc. 
Um, <coughs> Our individual backgrounds in combination uh, with the context that shapes what we see, of course. This is called framing. And there's an excellent book, which I was to go and show, but I forgot to stick it in here, but it's called uh, On Environmental Expertise by uh, Esther Turnout and others. The second chapter is about framing, and I can share the, the information about the book later. It's an excellent short book that very simply explains a lot of philosophical matters that can take quite a bit of time to get into, um, but it helps us to think around these things and why it matters how we frame problems. Um, so I'm going to illustrate with a few examples uh, to, to help you think with me about why framing might matter. And let's start with human excreta. Why on earth are we still using drinking water, which takes a lot of resources to produce, to flush our pee and poo. Why are we still mixing it with industrial wastewater? There's, I could go on and ask questions. So why are we, why are we, why are we? And there are many reasons that change is hard to come by. One often overlooked reason is that it's framed as a problem of waste that is handled by water. So we have wastewater, we have liquid waste, we have sewage, all of the terms that we use to talk about shit makes us think about water, white toilets with a button you can push and then it flushes out. Um, you think about the, maybe if you're an engineer, you think about the sewer lines, uh, we might think about the treatment plant, we might think about how to recover things from the sewage, which is a lot of stuff dissolved in water. And that means that we are stuck in a way of thinking. Uh, and engineers, when they start their education, that this is a problematic system that never ever will solve our problems, is not in the curriculum, maybe at the fourth or fifth year. But a lot of courses about hydraulics use examples from sewage treatment um, to help people think about hydraulics. So it becomes imbued in the brain that this is the solution we should have. So the framing is stuck. And when we have a framing that's stuck deeply inside us, it's really, really difficult to get out of it. And we're also blind to it. <coughs> um, we wrote a paper a few years ago, a postdoc of mine, Robin Harder, was the, the leader of it. And it's a thought experiment <coughs> backed up by a lot of modeling. What if we reframe uh, excreta management as part of the food and farming system. And uh, I won't go through the paper here, but what it shows, and the most important take home is not that one framing is better than the other, but what it shows is that the questions that we ask, the evidence that we find interesting, the solutions that we think of, the uncertainties that we care about and those we ignore, become completely different. Uh, and the, how it guides our thinking. <clears throat> and becoming aware and trying to flip the way we think about matters can help us to sort of rethink what are the things that we focus on? What is the data that we actually need to handle this problem if we rethink it as this? Have another example <coughs> from uh, Amanda Yang, who's one of my colleague at UBC and, and some other people that I don't know who they are, <laughs> but they've been working with, with um, fish pollution among other things. And in this paper, they make the, the thought experiment that today, when we're talking about fish, um, and that is polluted by mercury, for example. We look at how much mercury is there in the fish or other pollutants, and then we outline eating guidelines for that. What they do in this paper is they flip it, and they say, what if we want to be able to eat this much fish? What kind of data, what kind of policies do we need to be able to meet our desires? That's a completely different way to think about it. Totally. And this thing that data is objective, of course data is objective once you've collected it. But there is some thinking that goes into it before we collect the data. And of course it should be done in a way so anybody else could do it the same way that you do it. But before you collect the data, before you start interpreting them, you have an idea about what you're looking for. You have a frame in mind that makes sense of the data. <clears throat> so, 
with this, I, two examples, I want to illustrate that framing, framing matters because it determines the type of evidence we see as relevant, the type of uncertainties that we care about, the type of solutions we can imagine, and the type of policies that seem to make sense. In the introduction, I mentioned the scientists are trained to be curious, to ask questions, to probe, to debate, to be open-minded, uh, to go back to the drawing board and rethink. But the core of science is to be non-dogmatic. That's what most clearly distinguishes science from religion. I've said that before, there is no right answer. Scientists should not be dogmatic. We know that any method, evidence, theory, can be challenged by new method, new evidence, and new theory. I'm repeating myself, and that is consciously. Dissent and debate sit at the heart of science. Uh, we constantly critique each other. I see you seem to be slightly younger than me, most of you, so I guess that you're grad students. Uh, and that means that you are preparing proposals, uh, you're getting critiqued on those. When you write papers, we get feedback on that, we critique other people, uh, go to conferences, we get questioned, um, try to find funding, etc. cetera. Um, and when the debate, debate is healthy, it helps us to think through the problems we are dealing with in more depth. So science is a curiosity-driven enterprise. And if there weren't any unresolved issues, we would be out of business. When it comes to wicked problems, uh, complex and complicated problems of societal interest, what commonly happens is the scientific debates grow into controversies, and then they go into uh, fights. Uh, and more facts only make the scientific divides deeper. A number of studies have shown that this type of debates cannot be resolved by more research. This is highly problematic because it obscures the utility of science for policy. By convention, we leave the thinking about knowledge and the knowledge producing processes to historians, philosophers, sociologists and the like. Scientists, that's not science. And I would say it is science. It's scientists' responsibility to think about those processes in, co in, in collaboration with others. Um, and for one, this is problematic that we leave it to the humanities and social sciences, because scientists as a group are often highly suspicious of the work done by social science scholars. And they get very defensive, not seldom, uh, about the picture that science studies researchers paint of the scientific enterprise. But one reason is that the philosophers and sociologists, historians, etc., like most uh, researchers, they write for their own research community. And like most of us, they do not see it as their responsibility to translate their findings to their stakeholders. And in this case, their stakeholders are us. Um, so publications written by science study scholars are for the most part written to be understood by the inner circle and consequently a little use to the scientific community. Another reason is that many philosophers of science don't really understand the ins and outs of science simply because many of them aren't scientists. Some of them are. If we are to understand what's going on and what we, the scientific community, can do about it, we need to start to ask questions um, and be curious about our own knowledge producing processes. If we, the scientists, don't engage with these questions, uh, I don't believe we ever will be able to figure out how to increase the utility of research for policy. So, to walk the talk, I closed my chlorine lab in, in 2011. I've been doing research on chlorine biogeochemistry in combination with collaborating with social scientists and people from the humanities about the use of science in policy. And I've also been doing research about how to teach about these matters. So I closed my lab because I felt there's tons of exquisite scientists out there, but there are few who actually try to bridge this gap. And uh, at the Gesta lab, and we choose the Gesta because uh, it's, uh, it means uh, excreta. And, and we picked it because we need new words to talk about these matters. And to get a better understanding of what we're doing there, um, so, uh, right, so we're, we're, at, the, at the lab we're doing research about uh, these questions. 
And to get a better understanding of what's going on when a healthy scientific debate turns into a scientific controversy with locked positions, uh, one of my master's students, Bronwyn McElroy, she conducted focus groups uh, with two uh, groups of experienced scientists dealing with endocrine disrupting substances. And uh, there was a lively debate in both groups and the facilitator only sort of helped them to talk. Um, and then afterwards, she, the, they were recorded and she did an analysis uh, of these, um, uh, did a narrative analysis. And she tried to do an empathetic and, and symmetric approach, which means that she tried to not, did her best to not favor one group over the other. And the difference between the two groups were surprisingly stark. And I'll walk you through it. And the story that emerged from the first group, there were four central characters. In the background, we have the uh, invested industry, uh, the gray there, that lobbies for more permissive, re permissive regulation and has ties to the shady scientist um, who conducts biased research and undermines good research, which is conducted by the good, uh, the guardian scientist uh, who is, uh, who conducts unbiased, high quality research uh, on endocrine disruptors. Because of the pressure of the industry, uh, the shady scientist uh, and the shady scientist, the guardian scientist is forced to fight for unbiased research to be heard, at times having to use somewhat unorthodox methods. In this story, the public is poorly informed, not engaged in the debate. Um, so there is a need to find ways to get the public's attention uh, to these serious problems. The conflicted regulator struggles to find balance, uh, struggles to balance scientific, economic, and societal factors. And in this story, regulation is a battleground between scientific and political concerns. Remember this story. In the story that emerged in the second group, the activist scientist is the bad guy. They conduct questionable research on EDs. They inappropriately advocate for the research in attempts to impact the regulator and the supply content to the inciting media, which overblows the stories that makes the public, the overreactive public freak. And they push for regulatory action. The level-headed scientist who conducts objective research has a tough job to get their voice heard. In this story, regulation is driven by emotion not evidence. Most interesting of all, I think, is that both groups describe themselves as belonging to the majority view, the established consensus. And both groups, <coughs> no, sorry, discounted the other as a small group of people who really weren't real scientists at all and who, in the first story, were bought by the industry, and in the second story, were emotionally driven. How could these stories be so different? They, I should say, I should underline that they were, the people that were participating in these focus groups were established scientists, they published uh, really good papers in peer-reviewed literature, etc. So we made sure to make sure to have people who are established and well-recognized. <coughs> Well, previous research has showed that it's quite common that scientists on both sides of a scientific controversy perceive the other side as biased. And to understand this type of situation, I found the concept of thought styles quite useful. It's a concept that I have <coughs> borrowed from Ludwig Fleck, an Austrian physician uh, who in 1936 wrote this book, Genesis and Development of Scientific Fact. He uses the emergent understanding of syphilis as an example to illustrate that different researchers not only approach problems differently using different methods and concepts, they think differently about the problems. They have different thought styles. And the difference is so large, so at times they have difficulties understanding each other. The various factors leading to the formation of different thought styles. Uh, one is all the choices that we make during the research process. Doing research is to make choices. We decide what to study because we believe it's more important or more interesting or more fun to study something rather than something else. When we choose to something, study something, we also choose to not study something else. We decide what methods we'll be using, which type of evidence we'll be collecting, 
what kind of explanatory models we'll be using to make sense of the data, which uncertainties to care about, and which ones to ignore. We choose to study things we believe are important, more interesting, more relevant than something else. These are all value choices. We think something is interesting, relevant, important. And all of this, the framing, the standards of evidence, the explanatory models, the leaders to reach diverging conclusions. This is not a problem. It's a given. It's just how it is. The problem is that we are trained to think that if we do more research, these differences will eventually go away. And we will eventually reach consensus. Maybe not now, but sometime in the future. The thing is that when dealing with wicked, messy problems, cases that are complex and complicated, where some types of uncertainties are irreducible, uh, it might behoove us to contemplate that the way that we may never ever reach consensus. Uh, as a matter of fact, in situations like this, consensus might not even be desirable. If the perspectives are truly incommensurable, then the plurality of perspectives is likely to give a better understanding of the problem. This is surprisingly common in risk evaluation. Maybe it shouldn't be surprising at all, as we well know that different people have different risk tolerance. Um, I guess you all can take examples from your own private life. The sight people have no problems riding a motorcycle and they will never ever sit on one. And, or go smoke dope or whatever risk we're willing to take or take an airplane or whatnot. But when we're dealing with risks, uh, trade-offs must be made. And it's not given how those should be done. Um, the framing will have an impact on the design of the study, which evidence that is relevant, which explanatory models are appropriate, etc. cetera. Bronwyn, uh, the master student who analyzed the focus group, used the term manufactured consensus to describe the phenomenon we observed in the focus groups. It was pretty clear that both groups honestly believed that they belonged to the majority consensus view. Um, among the scientists that count. Neither group saw the, other uh, the others as scientists that count. <laughs> Bickering between scientists and between groups of disciplines is a well-known phenomenon. It starts already at the entry level at, at university, um, if you think about it. Physics students are trained to look down on chemists, uh, who look down on biology students, who look down on people from the social sciences, who look down on those reductionist scientists. Uh, so round and round it goes. Um, so Bronwyn's uh, thesis led to a couple of papers. And in our paper, we warned that manufactured consensus um, is what might happen when scientists and policymakers, in their eagerness to shut down fake news or uh, manufactured doubt, they also shut down healthy scientific dissent. While most scientists would agree that there can be a diversity of legitimate perspectives and that it's important to be open to new ideas, what happens in practice is actually quite different. Scientists within a certain school of thought hold shared views about what counts as good science, and they often regard scientists working from outside their perspective as doing bad science. I would imagine you can find examples from your own fields where you know that those guys are not good doing real science. We are doing real science. They should be doing it the way we are doing it. So uh, while scientists usually agree in the abstract that all legitimate views uh, should be considered, in practice, they are likely to see the other ones that see only those working from the same, from within their own perspective as legitimate. The tendency to judge science by others as bad and thus illegitimate science has unfortunately been exacerbated by the fight against fake news. Um, in the effort to resist fake news uh, or manufactured doubt, scientists may wall themselves off from dissent. And resulting dogmatism can prevent even robust and legitimate science. And what happens is we might actually be throwing out the baby with the bathwater. The history of debates um, about germ theory, uh, of, dis uh, germ theory of disease, uh, plate tectonics, uh, allergies, uh, ulcers, 
All of these I illustrate that minority views can later become the new scientific orthodoxies. The risk of throwing out the baby with the bathwater is further exacerbated by the strive for scientific consensus. Uh, if I know that I conduct high quality research and I have good intentions and I believe that consensus is possible and desirable, then it's easy to say that, well, your research doesn't align with mine. I know that mine is done well, then you must be wrong. So you're doing bad research or you're bought, you have ulterior motive motives. Couldn't be that you're doing really, really great research and come to completely different conclusions like you. And this is deeply, deeply ingrained in all of us. And I would say this is one of the major hinders to interdisciplinary collaboration and is a hinder for increasing the utility of research. Those who are concerned about the fake news, which I guess most of us are, uh, or manufactured doubt, they might feel that talking about manufactured consensus and dissent is to play right into the hands of irresponsible actors. One might think that the dangers of fake news are generally much greater than the dangers of manufactured consensus. Um, so it's not worth running the risk uh, of aiding bad actors. I disagree. Uh, I would say that public health and well-being can be put at serious risk, not only by fake news and manufactured doubt, but also by failing to be open to alternative scientific perspectives. We cannot forget that de ethyl still besterol DES, was one thought to be a safe drug for preventing complications of pregnancy. Uh, the germ theory of disease was initially dismissed out of hand. Trans fats were touted as being healthier than animal fats, and women suffering from chronic diseases were labeled as hysterical. Um, science needs to be open to dissent, and the line between well-founding and legitimate dissent is not always clear. So, but if the line between le legitimate and illegitimate dissent can be so blurry, how can the scientific community combat manufactured doubt without failing to fall into manufactured consensus. <clears throat> uh, as la laid out in this book, which I highly recommend, it's a bit, I wish they had written it in more accessible form. It's not totally inaccessible, but it's a bit woody, <laughs> but it's a great book. And they, <clears throat> in this book, they, light, they lay out and they explain why it's crucial for the scientific community to foster transparency. And I would say there's an urgent need to develop methods and procedures that allow for the identification of potentially relevant scientific perspectives and help us distinguish between legitimate and illegitimate dissent. In addition, it's crucial to reject the assumption the scientific consensus is necessary for uh, the formulation of public policy. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, although it's appealing to uh, uh, appear to, to, to scientific consensus, it might be rhetorically useful in some cases. It's actually bad for policy because it perpetuates the misleading perception the scientific agreement is necessary in order to formulate regulatory political action. To demand scientific consensus before acting is a red herring and merely provides incentive for the merchants of doubt to slow down policy making frame, by framing uncertainty as a reason to delay policy action. In most cases where it seems dangerous to acknowledge scientific uncertainty and disagreement, policymakers and publics are failing to protect environmental and public health because they're neglecting to take protective action that makes sense even in the absence of scientific consensus. In most policy situations, <clears throat> the most productive question to ask is not whether there is scientific consensus or not, but rather how to act in the face of limited scientific information. Because when questions are complex, when we have wicked problems, we will always have insufficient information. And for scientists, we can help by asking how much and what kinds of evidence are needed to justify taking action? What kind of error would be worse to take action on the basis of false alarm or to resist action in the presence of legitimate threat? Type one and type two errors. 
Which is worse? It varies with the problem. What win-win steps could be taken to address potential threats while continuing to collect more information? How could policymakers address potential threats in an adaptive way that allows them to formulate better responses as more information becomes available? <clears throat> I am uh, certainly not endorsing the view that anything goes or that anyone, anyone's views is equally legitimate. Good science is crucial for informing policy decision and every effort should be made to identify and root out misinformation. However, policy makers must be allowed to focus on their main task, which involves deciding what ought to be done. It is all too tempting to turn these difficult policy debates into proxy debates about this, what the scientific facts are. We must resist that, that uh, temptation and remember that our values are ultimately central to deciding what to do. This requires reflecting on our collective values as fully and carefully as possible, and scientists must be involved in these conversations. It's crucial, <coughs> sorry, that's too early. It's crucial to remember that scientific consensus alone cannot tell us what to do. And we can formulate thoughtful policy in the absence of scientific consensus. That realization is perhaps the key to fighting manufactured doubt without manufacturing scientific consensus. <coughs> Sorry. I've been using the words biases and values throughout the talk, and um, very often those two are conflated. So I want to spend a few minutes just talking about those two words and what they are. In short, you can say that biases are bad and values are good. Um, when it comes to, uh, we want to rid ourselves from our biases while ensuring that our research aligns with our values. Values, that's the things that we hold as bad and good. Very simple sort of definition of, of values. Biases are hidden factors that lead to that we, either without being aware of it, we cherry pick data, we design studies that provide a misleading picture. This may lead to that we conduct research that goes against our values. That, for example, leads to a more, more unequal society because we are unaware of the biases that guide how we frame our study. And then I give an example. I ran into a paper that I found a bit funny. I'm originally from Sweden. And uh, this paper <coughs> showed with a big statistical sample that people who, males who go to the sauna seven times a week, uh, they are less likely to have a heart attack than men who only go to the sauna once a week. Which country is this from? I would say it's from Finland. And I don't think there's another country you could get a sufficiently statistical uh, large sample to decide whether one day a week in the sun or seven days in the week actually is you know, statistically different. Well, going to the sauna is common. I grew up in northern Sweden where we also use the sauna a lot. And uh, since it's such a common procedure, a practice, it's of course important to know, is it good for your health to do this every day? Or is it bad for your health? That aligns with our values and the values of the Finnish society. You might have noticed I said males. So a problem with the study is that this was only about male heart health. And we know that that is, we look at the data, there is an enormous amount of data on men's heart health. And the past 10 years, I think, I haven't really read up on it, there's research that have shown that female heart health shows differently. When we have a heart attack, the, the signs are different, the treatment needs to be different, and so on. So, so conducting a study that only involves males means that there's an increased risk of misdiagnosis of females. So female Finnish people who go to the sauna seven days this week, are they less likely to get a heart attack or not? We don't know. But they're likely to get the advice that is the case. So this is a study that both is imbued by values, we know very well what's good for society, and it's biased. So this thing of finding out, are we actually doing research that align with our values or not, 
And we, what's important to remember is that we can never be totally free from our biases. They are sort of embedded in us, but we can try. Um, and uh, I wanted to point to this. Um, Heather Douglas, one of my favorite philosophers at Michigan State University, she has a 13 minute long video about biases and values. And I recommend you to look at it because it's so easy to slip into this to think that biases are values or values are biases. There is a slight overlap, but it's not very large. <coughs> so biases are bad and we need to vigilantly find ways to reduce those in our research while being aware that we can never totally free ourselves from them. Values in the contrast are good. We need to clarify what they are and we diverge from our values and we need to find ways to clarify the basis for choosing one path over the other. Um, before wrapping up, wrapping up, I wanted to highlight a specific challenge. In Canada, there's presently an increasing uh, strong expectation of including indigenous knowledge into existing systems such as chemicals management. There is, uh, <clears throat> There is a growing recognition that indigenous peoples in Canada are disproportionately exposed to pollution uh, because sewage treatment plants, garbage dumps, and heavily polluting industries have systematically been placed within a, a close vicinity to indigenous communities. This is an illustration from the Enrich project that maps black and indigenous communities in, in Nova Scotia. You can go to the website and you will be shocked about the overlap and it looks the same across Canada. The increasing recognition of the unequal distribution of the goods and the bads uh, from chemical industry is to a considerable extent uh, uh, known thanks to the environmental justice movement, which has led to the collection of innumerable samples of soil and water and air samples that shows that leaves no doubt that the vulnerable groups are the ones that are most exposed. In the best of cases, these studies are collaborative, like this one. In the worst of cases, samples are taken without consent and are purely extractive and damaging. Uh, and one of the many examples is that in 2021, the Ontario government measured and then withheld sulfur dioxide monitoring data from Amundsen Nation, uh, First Nation. And so they were extracting data without the consent of the community. And the backside of environmental justice research is that indigenous peoples first and foremost are portrayed as damaged and debilitated study objects. There's no difference between the moose and the indigenous in the studies. It's just data. And <coughs> associate uh, professor Eve Tuck, uh, she wrote this paper in 2009 and she calls for a shift from the, prominent, from the presently dominating approach, which is extractive and damage centered. And she wants us to focus uh, to capture desire instead of damage. <clears throat> the fact is that indigenous expertise in chemicals management typically only is invited after the fact. Once the water, the oil, and uh, the water, the soil, and the air, and the food has been polluted. Or when they're asked, they're usually, uh, indigenous knowledges are usually not meaningfully or respectfully engaged. As a reaction to these extractive pr research practices, the past decade has seen an increasing number of research projects in the environmental area that are indigenous led. These initiatives are making tremendous progress uh, in creating new knowledges and approaches. And a very exciting development is the emergent field of indigenous data and sovereignty practices, which includes the development of innovative protocols for data that affirm and enact indigenous modes of governance, which can be incorporated into chemicals management practices. What's rather disconcerting is that there's been very little uptake of this research uh, in chemicals management practices or dominant disciplines, such as toxicology or environmental chemistry. It's almost as if these things don't exist un until a non-indigenous person says it. Um, I'm gonna give you an example. This paper, which outlines the framework for how to include indigenous expertise in research, they underline the importance of including indigenous voices throughout the process. A baffling fact is that the paper is co-authored by eight non-indigenous people. This paper has been cited 500 times. This paper, which is extremely important and everybody should read it, has been cited 38 times. 
The first paper doesn't even cite that one, even though they are citing research from this paper. I'm getting a bit angry here. Um, let me see where I was saying. So I don't get lost. <laughs> so there's a growing realization in Canada and many other states that rest on colonial history uh, that we need to pave way for recognition and inclusion of indigenous expertise. Uh, if we truly wish to figure out how to transform institutional structures and pave the way for meaningful inclusion, we need to take a serious look at our own institutional structures. What processes and words censor inclusion and hinder progress? What attitudes and behaviors and actions perpetuate harm? Because whether we like it or not, we are part of a system that does perpetuate harm. So things in the system need to change. The question is, which ones and how? And how can you contribute? I'm embarrassed to say that a few years ago, this was totally new to me. And uh, I'm still on a very, very steep learning curve as the Gesta Lab is embarking on our new project, weaving indigenous knowledge into existing chemicals management structures. And I wish to take the opportunity to extend a warm thank you to my teachers and mentors, uh, Assistant Professor Sue Dudlow at the University of Guelph, Professor Michelle Murphy at the University of Toronto, Assistant Professor John Just Smiles at the University of Victoria, Atlanta Grant, a master's student at UBC. Moving forward, we're working with these colleagues, other indigenous and non-indigenous partners in Canada and Aotearoa New Zealand, as well as collaborators with Health Canada and Environment Canada, setting out to find ways to unveil factors that lead to that the exclusion of scientific... Oh, sorry, that was the wrong... That, it, you should have seen that one. <laughs> so now I'm gonna do that one before I go to the next one. Um, so what we're moving forward is we're setting out to f unveil factors that lead to the undue exclusion of scientific perspectives into chemicals management practices, including indigenous knowledge and expertise, which here is illustrated as a red one. It doesn't even get into the crappy system. <coughs> So um, what we're setting out to do is to support the creation of a more inclusive, rigorous, and transparent way to reconcile competing knowledge claims. To tie this up, uh, yeah, framing matters. It matters hugely. Uh, we need to be better at celebrating scientific dissent and foster a climate um, where scientific debate is very welcome, even heated debates. If future scientists, the students we're training today, buy into the cancel culture and don't learn how to be open to dissent, we won't be able to distinguish between appropriate and inappropriate dissent, and we won't be able to fight the merchants of doubt and fake news mongers. We need to recognize that when dealing with wicked, messy problems, consensus might not be possible. It might not even be desirable. More scientists must start to ask questions about our knowledge-producing processes. We have to work with philosophers and other social scientists to figure out uh, which factors impact our research without us realizing it. Which factors that lead to the we do, we, us doing biased research that might not align with our values. We also need to work together to find, out, find ways to figure out if our research aligns with our values or not. To do this, we have to become better at collaborating with science study scholars and other social scientists. But that won't work unless we're willing to look at our own practices. Because two of the largest barriers to interdisciplinary research is that we're blind to our own biases and we're bad at listening to what others have to say. Thank you. Thank Sorry, you. that was a little longer than intended. That's fine. We still have 10 minutes for questions. Maybe I can quickly start. Thank you very much for your presentation, first of all. I just wanted to ask you, I was triggered by the statement, consensus might not be desirable. So if you think about what happens in COP27 now in Egypt, I mean, it actually came out with a solution, but doesn't consensus help us to uh, agree on who is polluting, how much should be compensated, etc.? Um, there should be scientific before consensus. Scientific consensus might not be possible or desirable. Uh, that is different from political consensus. 
and in COP they ought to reach a consensus. <laughs> so, yeah. okay. so, sorry about that. Over, oversight should be scientific consensus, scientific dissent, and scientific consensus. That's clear. Thank you. Questions? Other questions? So please quickly introduce yourself if you don't mind. Thank you for your talk. I'm Philip van Capellen. We've we know each other. Um, when you when you say about change, I mean, there's of course individual change and institutional change, but a lot of the scientific institutional system is driven by funding. And so, um, do you have any com any ideas of how we should go about changing maybe the the, the funding of uh, research? I mean, our research is getting more and more programmed out of Ottawa, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, to in my case, NSERC. And that, to a large extent, also dis, uh, determines uh, what we re what we do research on, or to a certain extent, also forces us to certain partnerships. Um, and so, uh, if I look back at my scientific career, to a large extent, you always have this funding issue, uh -huh. and uh, and research is expensive. Yeah, I. I, I there are some positive changes. Uh, I've been trying for a long time to, to convince and assert that this kind of research is science. Uh, and both the NSERC Horizon call that was earlier stresses a lot about interdisciplinary collaboration and, and also the NFRFT uh, call. Um, so there seems to be change coming. But I think we, should, we need to, to press for interdisciplinary research and also for research where scientists are encouraged and forced to, to actually engage with their own knowledge producing processes. Um, as professors, we can get the funding and then we can let the students, we can encourage them to do things that can be argued to be within the framework. Um, so I think that, that supporting the students to actually go a little bit outside the strict limits of what the grant actually says. Um, not cheating, but Pushing the boundaries. Yeah. Hi, my name's. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, uh, my name's Rory. I'm a master's student here at the University of Waterloo in system design engineering. Uh, my question's about the balance between manufactured doubt and uh, manufactured consensus. Where I mean, the, I think the two most popular cases of manufactured doubt are cigarettes and climate change. One being possibly the deadliest technology we've ever invented, death tolls in a billion or so, I think, and the other one being a potential extinction level threat. There's obviously a big balance to overcome there, but I, I think you note, noted that there's a difference in different kinds of fields, like not everything is climate change and cigarettes. What are the sort of axes that you look at to differentiate the kinds of things where we should be more concerned about manufactured doubt? and think where we should be more concerned about manufactured consensus. Looking into how the, the goods and the bads are distributed and, and who, is, who is funding and who is behind certain research. And when you have, when you have very complex, we like cigarette smoke. <laughs> there was so that's it's an easier case because they have an industry which is clearly who the ones are benefiting and research supported by that industry was providing positive and sort of hiding things. Um, but when you, have, when you have more complex fields, uh, one is to not let yourself get pulled into this, that we have to have consensus in science before we can act politically. So that, that is a huge red herring, to never sort of fall into that, whether it's climate change or tobacco smoke. Uh, and the other is to see, to really look into the funding. And when you have strong funding sources where those who fund it are the ones to benefit, um, that is a huge red herring as well. But it doesn't have to mean that that research that comes out of it is, is bad. So it's, it's being able to look at the research and say, okay, is this just throwing a lot of new data on things to stall the policy? So the important part is to see what is the relation between science and policy here. And is uncertainty held up as a huge argument for not doing anything? So when it comes to asbestos, uh, tobacco smoke and all the examples in, in, in those books about uh, manufactured doubt or uh, the merchants of doubt. Uh, it was it's a lot of research done to make sure that action was not happening. 
And when you're getting research done specifically with the aim of stalling action, that is illegitimate dissent. Um, so that, that would be, but read that book <laughs> by Intiman. It's, it's a little bit, yeah, no, it's, um, because it's not easy, but their, their argument at the end is that transparency, more transparency about what values that are driving our research, what we think is a good society, where we'd like things to be, and also when our values diverge, be able to clarify uh, what we are choosing and what the basis for our choices are. Yeah, that sense. Thank you. We have another question here. Thank you, Gunila. I really uh, enjoyed your talk. My name is Rob Delo. I'm from the School of Environment Resources and Sustainability here. Um, I guess where I'm coming from is I, I'm, I'm looking around the room as you're talking, and each of us who comes to a room like this came from um, you know, came from places where we were trained, you know, whether it was cultural or educational or whatever, we're working in a system that reinforces certain kinds of behaviors, rewards other behaviors. And so whenever I hear a talk like this, uh, where somebody's saying, I want you to behave differently, I want you to think differently, I'm always asking myself, you know, well, what are some of the reasons why we, we are the way we are, why you're looking for that change? And so, Interdisciplinarity is a great example, I think. It's something we're trying to do at Waterloo. It's something that we try to do in the Water Institute. But there are some really good reasons and some powerful reasons why people are disciplinary. The system strongly, strongly rewards disciplinarity, uh, the practice, the training, the rewards, everything, right? And so it's a little bit the same, I think, in your case. And you touched on a lot of the points that I'm thinking of, but I'm wondering if you can kind of pull them together from your perspective terms of what do you, you know, what do you think are the, the systems of training, practice, and rewards that encourage people to not think the way that you want them to? In other words, what are some of the leverage points or the areas where we, where we need to start focusing to make changes if we want people to kind of switch to the different way of thinking that you're, you're advancing here in your talk? Well, if you could go like this and change things, it would start already when we start talking about water, for example, in, in, in primary school. Um, but but uh, university uh, level, I think at the very start, um, at the entry level, have students think about these things, to, to introduce thinking about the knowledge producing practices from the beginning. Why are we doing this? How are we doing this? How is this different? What are the strengths of doing it that way? And what are the, what are the risks of doing it that way? So sort of metacognition, meta-understanding of the things we're doing, because I agree with you, there's very good reasons for doing the things we do it, but we are not reflecting on why we're doing it this way. So introducing reflection in every course uh, about what are we doing, how does this fit in the bigger picture, and use time for that in parallel. So it's not that we have a course over here where you think about things, but you actually practice thinking about your practices throughout uh, your education, I would say. So that, that would be my answer. That you and we have, I can share a paper. There's an uh, a introductory seminar that we have at UBC, which I was director for for five years, four years, um, where the incoming students, they learn how to write, uh, they learn how to think about the scientific process, um, and uh, and they also get to meet professors more in person because the courses are so huge, so they get lost in the system. And they are forced to write an argumentative essay. Uh, and, and they actually do it really well based on scientific papers. And part of it is that they reflect on the scientific process while they're doing this. Um, and uh, it's a wonderful course. Uh, it's a bit expensive because we, we have a lot of people involved in it. But that, that way of doing reflection in parallel while you're learning other things. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I, I have to say I'm very, very impressed by what you said that 10 years ago, a little bit more. You just gave up your lap and you started com something completely new. I, I think she deserves a really uh, warm uh, round of applause. Thank you very much, Gunilla, for coming here, answering the questions.